sisters. It's such a pleasure to be here. To be back here. It feels like home. Who do here this feel? You all heard that? Who do here this feel? My mother, when I was a little boy, I always hear my mother say, who do here this feel? Now, I remember when I was a little boy, I used to interpret that to think, well, if I don't listen to mommy, I would feel the belt. <laughs> and yeah, I really feel that belt quite a few times. Eh? But now I've grown up to be, well, a little man. <laughs> I can't say that when mommy say, who do hear this feel, it meant a lot more than feeling the belt. And you know something? The consequences of not hearing and feeling is better I feel the belt. Well, you could relate to that? Because when we don't listen, when mommy says don't hear, what she really means is who don't listen and follow this feel. And boy, I have felt quite a few times and still feeling. God told Adam and Eve, if you eat, you will die. Don't eat from that particular tree. If you eat from that fruit, if you eat from that tree, you will die. In the day you eat from it, you will die. Now, I don't know how long it took Adam and Eve to start to eat from this fruit. eh? I don't know how long they were listening, how long they were following. But after, after a while, they eventually didn't hear. They eventually didn't listen. And we know the story. We all feel in as a result of what they had done. So, when we don't listen, we pay. You know the story of Abraham? I like this story. Eh? We all know this story. When God told Abraham, now Abraham suffered eh? Because he had no children for many, many, many years. He was a very old man before he had his even first child, Ishmael. But he really wanted to have a child with his wife, Sarah. And what happened to Abraham is that when he finally got this child, now Abraham was a God-fearing man. I only know Abraham was a, a, a man who loved God. He loved God with his whole heart, his whole soul, and his whole mind, and his whole strength. There's no question about God, Abraham's love for God. And God told Abraham one day, Abraham, yes Lord, take your son, who you love. Now, <laughs> I don't know, God seems to push it, because he remind Abraham, the son who you love. Take your son, who you love, and go and sacrifice him to me. I have one son. I don't know what it would be like if God were to say, Thomas, take your son, who you love, because I really love my son. Take your son, who you love, and sacrifice him to me. Now the scripture tells us, in the book of Genesis, chapter 22, that Abraham got up next morning early and set about this task. You know what I like about that particular story? That sometimes we seem to pass over. Abraham didn't question him. Abraham just followed the instruction and he didn't question. Now, some years before that, when God wanted to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and God appeared to Abraham, and God came to Abraham and spoke to Abraham about going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. You You all remember what Abraham did? Abraham, wait, Catholics, you all know the Bible. (laughs) Abraham bargained. Abraham pleaded. He pleaded to God for his nephew Lot, who was living in Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham questioned. You, if there is a hundred righteous men, you will destroy the whole city. If there is fifty righteous men, you will destroy the whole city. And so Abraham went pleading. He went pleading for his nephew. But at this particular time, when God told Abraham, 
pick up your son, who you love, and sacrifice him to me. Abraham listened and he didn't question. Now that is probably one of the hardest things you could ask a parent, you know. Not just to have them kill it, for them to actually do it. So God asked Abraham, go and do it. Abraham got out early next morning. He picked out his son and he had two servants and he went. Now, they journeyed for about three days. You could imagine what was going on in Abraham's mind and heart during that three days. You just put yourself in that position or try to put yourself in that position. And for three days, you know exactly what you're going to do. You haven't revealed it to anybody. You're just going to set out the stars. You're going to kill your son. You're going to offer your sacrifice to God. Israel listening, eh? That man listening. Eh? We're walking on three days. You're going to this faraway land. Three days walk. And you're going to sacrifice your son. The scripture tells us, when they reached Mount Moriah, Abraham, Abraham told the servants, you're all the way there. Me and Isaac, we're going to worship. Abraham gave Isaac the wood to carry. The wood that he was going to build his altar, the burnt offering. Abraham gave it to Isaac for Isaac to carry the wood that was going to sacrifice him with. Now, scholars do not know exactly, they, they haven't determined exactly how old Isaac would have been. But for him to be able to carry enough wood to sacrifice himself, he couldn't be a five-year-old child. He had to be somebody with some able body to be carrying, because the, the amount of wood it will take to sacrifice to make a wood offering. Plus he carried the fire, whatever they used to make the fire. For that to happen, he had to be of able. So Isaac carrying, you know, it really prefigures God and Jesus. Jesus carrying his cross to Calvary. But Abraham setting about this task, and then Isaac would say, Father, yes, my son, we have the wood, we have the fire, but we have no lamb. You only remember what Abraham told him? <laughs> but he said, yes, the Lord will provide a lamb for the burnt offering. And when they reached to the spot where it had to happen, for some reason, there is no, there is no, uh, there is no thought, there is no transmission of information that Isaac resisted. You ever wonder how come? Daddy, you're going to kill me? Daddy, you really going to do this? There's no, no record at all of Isaac resisting his father. Isaac voluntarily laid on himself. And the scripture says that Abraham was really going to do it. Abraham was really going to do it. That is where you call feet. That is where you call somebody who listens. I wish I could listen like that. That man really listened. You know, Abraham, because he listened. Now God's, you know the story, God spared Isaac. But because Abraham and Isaac listened, they received such a great reward. There's a reward that somehow we seem to pass over in scripture that Abraham got. There's a Jewish tradition that Jesus Christ acknowledged that is said in the Gospel of Luke when Jesus Christ talked about the rich man and Lazarus. You all remember where Lazarus went? Lazarus went to the bosom of Abraham. There's a Jewish tradition that when Jews, when they die before Jesus Christ came, they would be in a nice place. They would be in a nice place and that place is called in the bosom of Abraham. And Jesus Christ said, Lazarus went to the bosom of Abraham. Apart from Abraham having a whole nation named after him, apart from him being the father of a great nation, Abraham was even, had even received heavenly glory. We acknowledge that when they die, the Jews acknowledge that when they die, the good Jews that die, the good people that die, they go to the bosom of Abraham. Because Abraham listened, he got his just reward. God didn't forget him. What about us? God guides us in many different ways. Sometimes God uses people to talk to us. 
Sometimes he used your parents, he used authority. God also used his Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit, in most cases, God uses his Holy Spirit to guide us. He even uses his Holy Spirit to prod somebody else to go and guide you. The Holy Spirit always plays a part in God's guidance. I'll give you an example. Now we're talking Old Testament here. I'll give you an example. I like the story of Moses. Moses came out. You know all the torture that Moses went through when he came out of Egypt? Out of the Red Sea. The ten plagues, Moses really suffered. And when they came out of the Red Sea, they, they, now these Jews, they saw the miracles. Um, scripture says it was about 600,000 men on foot. That's not counting women and children, eh? so maybe about a million and more people. But whatever it was, it was a lot of them. And when they came out of the Red Sea, now for those of you who travel to Sinai and you just come out of the Red Sea, you know that that place really, really barren. There's absolutely nothing, only rock. There's nothing. This place really, really barren. And they come out to the Red Sea, and they're hungry. God provided for them. He listened to Moses. He provided for them. He sent manna for them. After they, they received manna for a while, they eaten manna, they get tired of the manna, and they started to complain. In the spirit time, you can read this in um, Numbers chapter 11. They started to complain. And when they started to complain, Moses heard their cry. Now, Moses went to God and said, what it is you bring me here for? I didn't make these people. I didn't conceive these people. This is your people. What it is you bring me here for? Listen, God, better yet, kill me, yes? And get, let me, I don't want to deal with these people anymore. Now, <laughs> Moses right there and then gave up. Right? Because these people, you could imagine hundreds of thousands of people Murmuring and complaining to you. You, their leader, they're complaining to you. You have, there's no resources in this place. Now, what God had already provided for them, they're not satisfied. They even start to complain. I remember all the things that were eaten in Egypt under slavery. Under slavery, they start to lust for the things that they had in, in Egypt and they want it back. Now, they're in the middle of nowhere. Could you imagine how they complain? We try to the word complaining, eh? Could you imagine how they, know, how they complain? They must have complained so vociferously. Poor Moses. What a Lord. And he tell God like it is in, Gen, in, in the book of Numbers chapter 11. He said, Lord, what you bring me here for? I didn't conceive these people. Or I didn't give birth to these people. Or. God told Moses. He said, listen. Bring 70 of your best men. Now listen carefully. Eh? Bring 70 of your best men. Bring them to me. I will take the power of the spirit that is upon you. I will take some of it. Depending on the translation you read, it's going to vary a bit. eh? One translation says, I will take the power of the spirit, some of the power of the spirit that is upon you, and I will pour it upon the 70 men. You all realize what happened there? In In that few words, God telling Moses, Moses is a man who walk with God's spirit. And God is going to take that spirit and distribute it to 70 men. They would have his spirit and he would be able to control, govern, and lead these people. Now, you realize where I'm getting at? God's spirit. God uses his spirit to lead and guide his people. It's amazing that, you know, he knows that sometimes if he just tell you something, you need a little help. And he give us a little help. But he gave Moses a little help and he gave him his spirit. I like it so much, you know, that it makes me realize that in this modern day that we live, God's spirit, he ain't take back that spirit, you know. That spirit remain. And what does that have to do with us here as Catholics? What does that have to do with the Catholic Church? 
What I like about this is that God is very consistent. In the book of Luke, in the beginning, in the very embryonic stages of our Catholic faith, in the book of Luke, when the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary, now Gabriel stands before God, and when the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary, he said, Hail Mary, full of grace. Full of grace. And he explained to her what is to take place. You all remember what she said? Be it, let it be done or be done unto me according to thy word. Now she was full of grace. He also told her that the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. And you would give birth to a son. And he'll be the son of the most high. Now right there and then, she listened to the angel. She was puzzled at how he greeted her. She has never heard anything like this. She has never gotten any forewarning that, hey, mommy and daddy are going to be telling her, you're going to be giving birth, you're going to be giving birth to the Son of God. You know? It just came upon her right there and then. Not only did she listen, you know, right there and then, she obeyed. Be it done unto me according to thy word. Right there and then, she obeyed. What is, even, what is nice about that story is that the Holy Spirit plays an active part in that story. You know. When she went to visit Elizabeth, right? When she went to visit Elizabeth, Scripture specifically mentions that Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and Elizabeth uttered these words, Blessed are the fruit of thy womb. Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. She being filled with the Holy Spirit. She also said, Who am I for the mother of my Lord to come unto me? Who am I for the mother of my Kyrios? That word Kyrios means Lord and God. Who am I for the mother of my Lord to come unto me? She being filled with the Holy Spirit. And then she uttered the words and she uttered what we know as the Magnificat. Mary was filled with the Holy Spirit. She uttered the Magnificat. And there are certain words in the Magnificat, the Magnificat that I like so much. It says... All generations shall call me blessed. Before I was Catholic, I've never called her blessed. But in scripture, filled with the Holy Spirit, all generations shall call me blessed. After the birth of Jesus Christ, when Jesus was born, the, the um, Zachariah was who saw him. And he said, ah, he started to talk. Remember he was dumb? And he started to talk. And he said, I could go now. Sorry, Samuel. Simeon, 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 sorry. (laughs) Now, the birth of Jesus Christ and his life, Scripture says he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He's always filled with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus, when he was beginning his church, he promised certain things that would happen to his church. Jesus Christ, in preaching the gospel to his disciples, in preaching about himself to them, he made certain promises. He says, in John chapter 14, when Jesus Christ was saying, I am the Father one, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Jesus Christ said, I will send the Holy Spirit, and he will guide you into all truth. You know, that text is so nice. You know why it's so nice? Because of the fact that we sometimes forget that Jesus' church is guided by his Holy Spirit and it's not just men. The Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. In John chapter 14 and John chapter 16, he says, He will remind you of all the things I said and all the things I did. Now, in the book of John, John said, John said, there are many things that Jesus Christ did. There are many things that Jesus Christ said, but there are not enough books to record all these different things. But Jesus promised his Holy Spirit to guide his church. On the day of Pentecost, you all remember what happened on the day of Pentecost? On the day of Pentecost, there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ died, went back to heaven. An outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And Peter got up and started to preach. They all preached in tongues. 
because of the Holy Spirit, people were baptized. How many, how many came in the church that day? 3,000 people baptized that day because of the Holy Spirit. What about us? How has the Holy Spirit been with you? The first thing you have to do is to say yes. Just like our lady, the first thing you do is say yes. Now, I remember in my journey to the church, I made a prayer. And I said, Lord, I really want to know the truth. You know. Guide me to the truth. I will accept it no matter what. If you listen to the conversion stories of many people who convert to the Catholic Church, that is something that they all acknowledge. I will accept it no matter what. Guide me. And sometimes God talked to us in many different ways. But when we submit ourselves and accept, when we subject ourselves to God and accept, God guide me, you know what happens? We begin to recognize when he speaks to us. I used to hear many ladies, many older ladies say, God tell them this, God tell them that. And 10 years ago, I used to know them. I used to say, nah, 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 God ain't talking to you. God stopped talking to people. I used to know them, right? But you know something? If I had only listened, and if I had only listened and not suffered the consequences of not listening, I realized, hey, God was talking to you then, you know. It took so many experiences or not hearing and feeling. Who do hear is feel? It took so many experiences of feeling the pain, and I realized, you know, I should have. I should have. You know, and I regret that I didn't. Many things I'm paying for now that I realize the voice was talking to me. They didn't know Thomas, but he didn't listen. He didn't listen to God's Holy Spirit. Somebody come and give you advice. Somebody comes and tell you something. I didn't listen. Why did I listen? I should have. And then when we train ourselves and open our hearts to God, we recognize when he's talking to us. Because you see, sometimes God's will may not be our will. And sometimes when we praying for God's will, we afraid God's will. I can tell you, sometimes I feel I want something, I'm praying for something, eh? and I wonder if I should say, let your will be done, boy. <laughs> because sometimes God's will is for you not to have it. And I wonder if, I wonder if, anyhow, 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 God, let your will be done. And sometimes you ain't get it. You vex, you ain't get it. And, you know, admittedly, why God, why? And your faith has to come in to tell you, wait and you will see why. Five years down the road, a year down the road, six months down the road. You know, it's a good thing I didn't get it. <laughs> well, you know about that, eh? It's a good thing I didn't get it. If I had only got it, I'd have been in trouble. If I had only taken it, if I had only done it, I would have been in trouble. God speaks to us in many different ways. And sometimes it takes for us to just submit ourselves, subject ourselves to God's will. You know, when we study scripture, and we can't seem to find an answer for something, but you're by yourself, eh? You want to find the answer, and you say, God, give me your Holy Spirit, I want to find out the answer to this. And you're reading your scripture, and he's not revealing anything to you. Or you think he's not revealing anything to you. And somebody comes and tells you, you know, Thomas, so and so and so and so and so. Maybe you should check the church. What does the church have to say? You all know the story of Philip. When the Holy Spirit told Philip, there was this guy, this African guy, riding a chariot, and the Holy Spirit told Philip, go and talk to that man. That guy was reading the book of Isaiah, right? He's uh, the servant of the queen of Ethiopia called Candace. And he was reading the book of Isaiah on the chariot, and the spirit told Philip, go and talk to that man. Philip ran alongside the chariot, and Philip asked him, you know what you're reading there? And the guy said, how can I, without somebody explaining it to me? Philip got on board, explained the book of Isaiah to him what he was reading, explained to him that Jesus of Nazareth, come, Jesus of Nazareth died for your sins, and you will go to heaven, just put faith in Jesus of Nazareth, and believe, and act according to your faith, and Philip explained everything to him. 
You know what is nice about that story? Where did Philip come from? Philip is a member of the church. You see, this has everything to do with the Catholic church. Is that the Ethiopian eunuch reading the Bible was not, what, was not subjected to interpret it for himself. He didn't set about, I will read this and I will understand this by myself. But the Spirit was upon him as well. And the Spirit nudged him for him to realize, I need help, you know. And the Spirit combined these two characters, these two people, Philip and this Ethiopian eunuch, we don't know his name. The Spirit combined these two, and this man was able to get baptized right there and then. Because Philip gave a witness. But you know, Philip is the same guy who was with Jesus Christ in John chapter 14 when Jesus Christ said, the Holy, I will send the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will guide you. Philip was the guy who said when Jesus Christ was ranting and raving about, listen, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. I am the Father are one. I am in the Father and the Father is in me. If you see me, you see the Father. That same Philip was saying, if we see you, we see the Father. Well, show us the Father and the Lord. Remember what Jesus said? Show you the Father. Haven't I been here all this time? How could he say, show, show you the Father and I here all this time? It is the Father living in me doing these works. I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Believe it because of the works that I do. That's the same Philip. That's the same Philip who received the Holy Spirit and the church has guided him into all truth. That same Philip, the Holy Spirit sent to preach to this Ethiopian guy. And give a good witness. And this Ethiopian guy went back to Ethiopia. And spread the gospel with all those who he knew. Now. There's a particular feature of my church that I love very much. And. I do not have to worry. About whether the church is teaching me error or not. The promise is made. Guiding to all truth. You know. Sometimes. When we feel that we know more than the church. And we feel we know more, we're going to interpret things ourselves. Martin Luther, in the 16th century, when he formed his Reformation, he decided that you see the Bible, all we need is the Bible, we, didn't, we don't need no church. The result of that is that there are over 30,000 different Christian denominations in the world because everybody seems to want to interpret Scripture for themselves. Everybody wants to interpret Scripture for themselves. So they all pray for the Holy Spirit to guide them, just as said in the scripture here. But they all come up with different teachings. Many of them come up with teachings that contradict each other. But Jesus never promised that that is what, he, that is what is going to happen. Jesus promised that he will guide his church into all truth. He's going to guide his church into all truth and it, his, the Holy Spirit will remind them of all the things that he told them. If the Holy Spirit is guiding his disciples, into all truth. Is there any room for error? Is there any room for error if the Holy Spirit guiding his people? You know, Jesus used, we have the Bible, Jesus used fallible men to write this. Fallible men wrote an infallible book. Because men were born along by the Holy Spirit and inspired by the Holy Spirit to write the Bible. All of us agree that this is infallible. The scriptures are infallible because it is God's word. But like the Ethiopian guy, he said he needed somebody to interpret it for him. And Jesus gave us his church. 1 Timothy 3.15 says, The church is the pillar and foundation of truth. You want to know truth? Go to the church. Because the scriptures point you to the church. The famous text in Acts chapter 15 that I mentioned many, many, many times when they had a dispute and the, there were Jewish Christians who were saying that you have to get uh, circumcised in order to be saved and keep the law of Moses. It causes a dissent among the first century Christians. Paul and Barnabas was with, the, with these Christians and they were em emphasizing for everybody to get circumcised and keep the law of Moses. Now, what did the body of Christians do? Well, Paul and Barnabas had to go up to Jerusalem. They met Peter and all the body of elders, all the apostles were there. 
And they came in a council and they decided. In, Mark, in Acts chapter 15, verse 28 and 29, there's a particular statement that is made that I always keep in the back of my mind. When they had met in council and they decided, listen, you no longer need to keep the law of Moses. You no longer need to get circumcised. They sent out a letter. And in that letter, the letter goes like this. It pleases the Holy Spirit and we ourselves. It pleases the Holy Spirit and we ourselves. No further burden added to you. You don't have to keep the law of Moses, no circumcision. What you have to do is abstain from idols, abstain from, abstain from things strangled, abstain from fornication, and abstain from blood. Do these things and you will fare well. Now, if you sit down by yourself and you go in and interpret scripture, when you come up with your own doctrine or your own dogma, will you be, will you be willing to say, it pleases the Holy Spirit and you, X, Y, and Z? Do you think you have the authority to say that? Many people try to do that. You know what ended up happening? I remember there was a period of time where people were saying that the Holy Spirit guided them to determine that Jesus Christ would come in particular times. There's 1843, 1844, 1874, 1878, 1914, 1915, 1925, 1975. And there's a whole list from the time Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago where people were saying he was going to come back at a particular point in time. Now, when they were preaching, I can tell you this, when they were preaching, they claimed that the Holy Spirit guided them to come up with these conclusions. In 1843, when he didn't come, they said, okay, we made a mistake in our calculations. We went back and we prayed, and they came up with 1844. In 1844, when he didn't come, you know what they said? They said, um, he is now invisibly present. But didn't Jesus Christ say in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, that I will be with you until the end? Go and make disciples. I will be with you until the end. He's always invisibly present. And then another group come and say, listen, he will come in 1874. He didn't come in 1874. They say, wait, we have to go back and, and, and calculate again. He come in in 1878. When he didn't come in 1878, they said, okay, 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 we made a mistake. He come in in 1914. 1914 came, there was a great war, there was the first world war, he didn't come, they say we make a mistake, 1915. And so it goes, so it goes. And people claim to have the Holy Spirit, but yet still, they teach error. My Catholic faith, for those of you who are listening, for those of you who are watching, my Catholic faith for 2,000 years, have been challenged about her teachings and her doctrines and has always stood the test of time. You know, if you study the church history, you realize that the church is challenged most times from within. A bishop, a pastor, a priest, sorry, a bishop, somebody from within challenges the church. I'll give you an example. There was this particular, uh, in the 4th century, there was this particular, um, he's called the patriarch, of Constantinople called Nestorius. And Nestorius started to preach that Mary is not the mother of God because who she gave birth to was not God. Jesus is only God when he goes back in heaven. So he said, Mary, two things, two things he started to teach. And this man, this man was a Catholic. Eh? This man was a Catholic. And he was teaching that Jesus is not fully God. Right? When he go back in heaven, then he's God. Mary gave birth to a human. She didn't give birth to God. The church met in council. That causes a big uproar in the church. And the church met in council in a place called Ephesus. The reason why I'm smiling is because you all know that Mary lived in Ephesus. And the church held a council in Ephesus. It's the, the council of Ephesus in the year 431. And they met with Nestorius, and they battled about 250 bishops met him. And when they met with Nestorius, they battled him. They debated him, and they battled him. And then the church came up for us that Mary is Theotokos, meaning she's the bearer of God. That Jesus Christ is fully God, 
fully man, even when he was in the womb of his mother. He tried to teach error. But because of him, now the Holy Spirit guides it just so beautifully, is that from this confusion, from this, from this heresy, the church starts to define dogma. The church starts to define doctrine. And if you read the notes from these dogmas, from these councils, it, was, it is such a witness to you, you would say, well, wait a I didn't know this. Because what came out of these, of these battles is so profound. The church declared in 431 that Mary is Theotokos, bearer of God. And it is because Jesus Christ is fully God, fully man, when he was in heaven, when he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, when he was in the womb of his mother, when she gave birth to him, he is fully God and fully man, and that makes Mary mother of God. And the church has been challenged over and over for the past 2,000 years because we call the mother of Jesus the mother of God. There are many Catholics who stop believing that Mary is the mother of God. But that is not new because we've been going through that all the time. But the church has defined and declared for us that Mary is Theotokos because Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. Jesus, I quoted a scripture a while ago in John chapter 14 when Jesus was saying that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. When Jesus Christ was declaring, I am the Father, I won. And Philip challenged Jesus, show us the Father. What Jesus tell him? Jesus says, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. The works that I do is the Father living in me doing these works. That is why Jesus Christ, even when he was not speaking, Nestorius' teaching could not be correct because Jesus declared himself as God. John says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus Christ is the Word. All things came to being by means of the Word. Everything that was created was created by the Word. So when God said, let there be light, there was light, because that Word is God. And that Word became flesh and lived among us. That is why John could have said the Word is God. But Jesus Christ remained the Word and always God when he was in the womb of his mother. So the church made this declaration by means of the Holy Spirit. So at the end of that council, the church could have confidently says, confidently say, it pleases the Holy Spirit and we ourselves. Too many of us Catholics pick and choose our teachings and doctrines. What we want to believe, what we don't want to believe. I believe this, I believe that. I've heard several times in the last 12 years from many Catholics that I don't go into confession at all because I do not believe in confessing my sins to a priest. And, you know, it's, it's really sad. It hurts me. You know why it hurts me? Because, I will tell you this. In the sacrament of confession, the Holy Spirit plays a big part. You know why? When Jesus Christ walked in the upper room and Jesus Christ met the disciples, you all know this. When he met the disciples, what did he do? He breathed the Holy Spirit on his disciples. And he said, whose sins you're forgiven, they're forgiven. Whose sins you retain, they retain. He didn't walk in the upper room and just say, oh, let's start forgiving sins. No. It didn't happen like that. By means of the Holy Spirit that he bestowed on his disciples, they now are able to forgive sins. You know, Jesus Christ was, was um, almost killed because he forgave people's sins. And the Jews are saying, is only God can forgive sins? Jesus knows only God can forgive sins. That is why he told them. That is why he breathed the Holy Spirit and says, receive the Holy Spirit whose sins you're forgiven. By means of the Holy Spirit in them, operating in them, authorized by Jesus Christ, they now can forgive sins. And James says, if anybody is sick among you, let him go to the older men and let him confess their sins. In James chapter 5, let, them, let him confess their sins to the older men. And if he has any sins, his sins will be forgiven. James didn't have no doubt about it, you know. He says, if he has any sins and he confesses his sins, his sins will be forgiven. Because James knew that Jesus had given them the chosen of forgiveness. He had given them the Holy Spirit, and by means of the Holy Spirit, they are able to forgive sins. 
So if it is we intend to pick and choose teachings of the church, it's a mistake. I have tried to, to prove this church wrong on so many different teachings and doctrines. I have tried, I have asked a question, where is purgatory in the Bible? Where is this? Where is that? I want to know everything in the Bible. And you know funny, the church is always right and I was always wrong. And the reason for that is because of the Holy Spirit. You can't deny the Holy Spirit. You cannot say, I know more than the Holy Spirit. The promises of Jesus is that the Holy Spirit will guide his church. Remember Jesus Christ told Peter, upon you I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail. The gates of hell shall not prevail in his church. The gates of hell will prevail if his church starts to teach error. Anytime Jesus' church starts to teach error, the gates of hell prevail. There is a difference between infallibility and impeccability. The Pope is not impeccable. The Pope goes for confession. We never declare that the Pope is without sin. It's a misconception. Many times people believe that the uh, Catholics say the Pope is infallible. No. The Pope is not, the Pope is infallible as far as doctrines and morals are concerned. If perchance we have a Pope that is not good, don't worry, he is not going to make any declaration that is error. But because Jesus promised his church that the Holy Spirit will guide his church, he keeps his church free from error. So when I start challenging all the doctrines, all the teachings that I can challenge, the church has proved me wrong. Because it's not me have the Holy Spirit when I'm doing that. It's the church have the Holy Spirit. And all her teachings and doctrines, the church can easily say it pleases the Holy Spirit. And we ourselves, you will fare well. My dear friends and brothers, if you are feeling as though, I can't understand this particular teaching, you know. I can't understand this particular doctrine, you know. Don't worry. Let God's Holy Spirit take hold of your life. And when God's Holy Spirit take hold of your life, subject yourself like Abraham. Subject yourself like Mary. Subject yourself like the apostles. And don't worry, when you do that, you would see how he would reveal himself to you. I had a hard time coming to understand, coming to accept most Catholic teachings. A real hard time. But all I ask is say, Lord, let me give it a try. Open up my heart, open up my mind. And it's amazing that with acceptance, he helps you to understand afterwards. And the things that you don't understand, just for a minute, trust. Abraham didn't understand what he was doing, why God wanted him to do that. Why God wanted to sacrifice my son. He didn't understand, but he trusted God. And because he trusted God, he got his reward. Because he listened, because he hear, because he followed, because he didn't question, he just followed God, no matter what, he got his reward. Remember, remember when Jesus Christ was saying, eat my flesh and drink my blood? Nobody understood why, nobody understood how. And he turned to his disciples and he said, oh, what all you want to leave to? What Peter said, where we go go? You have the sins of everlasting life. Where will we go? I ask you this question. For brothers and sisters who have left, where are you going? Jesus have the sins of everlasting life. The church that Jesus left, the church that Jesus created for us, has the message of eternal life. His spirit dwells in that church. That church has stood the test of over 2,000 years of being battered, being beaten, people pelting stones behind this church. I used to pelt big stones behind the Catholic church. People spent 2,000 years. If you study, I employ everybody. From tonight, take a little history. Google the history of the Catholic church. Read with an open heart and an open mind the history of the Catholic church. Cardinal John Newman once said, study history and you will become Catholic. See the battles the church had to do. Now, 
members of the church are not without sin. Popes are not without sin. We are not without sin. We don't profess perfection. Examine the teachings and the doctrines of the Catholic faith. Check it for yourself. See how it is the church had to battle to come up with these teachings. How the church had to teach things and protect these teachings and doctrines. You know, the same Bible that we get licks with. The church protect the Bible for 2,000 years. The church had to protect this because emperors were burning Christians at stakes for having the Bible. The church protected the Bible for the last 2,000 years. And I ask this boldly. Where were you? 500 years ago, where were you? 800 years ago, where were you? Where were you 1,500 years ago? Where were you 1,700 years ago? Who was protecting the Bible? Who was protecting God's word? Who was protecting God's church? As Ignatius of Antioch says, the Holy Roman Catholic Church. The church is Catholic. The church is universal. The church has stood the test of time. My dear friends, because of this, please be guided accordingly. Thank you.